My name is Chad Bound, and I am a senior economist with the World Bank in Washington, D.C., in the Development Research Group. Uh, as background, I was selected to Phi Beta Kappa as an undergraduate student at Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. After college, I pursued and was granted a Ph.D. in economics at the University of Wisconsin in the late 1990s, and then my first real job after graduate school was as a professor of economics at Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts. I served on the faculty at Brandeis for 12 years, where in addition to working on research and teaching, I had the opportunity to serve on the Phi Beta Kappa Student Selection Committee on, on a number of occasions. And so it's from that perspective that I'm particularly honored to be with you here today. Uh, what is it that I do today? Well, nowadays I focus my time and energy on uh, economic scholarship, and in particular my focus is on international economic policy and trade policy in particular. That's what I work on at the World Bank. I'm very interested in questions relating to international economic cooperation in particular, and I study institutions like the World Trade Organization or the WTO, it's more commonly referred to as the WTO. I want to know questions like, what can we get out of these organizations? What are the limits to which they can sustain cooperation uh, for, for countries in, in difficult economic times and in, in good economic times? And so that's what I tend to study. To put that into context today, what I thought I would do is to talk a little bit about a recent book that I've just published called The Great Recession and Import Protection. To provide a little, a little bit more context and precision, what I mean by the Great Recession, obviously, is the recent global economic crisis. And in particular, the book focuses on the years 2008 and 2009. So let's begin in the summer of 2009. Uh, if you are a trade policy junk junkie, uh, what was happening in, the in, in July of 2000, in, sorry, let's start with 2008. In 2008 and July, uh, the trade ministers of the world were gathered in Geneva for the latest round of negotiations on the WTO's uh, Doha round, and unfortunately the negotiations collapsed, and we are still left with this issue unresolved. On the side of good news, in the summer of 2008, we had Spain winning the European Cup, we had the Olympics being held in Beijing, we were at the height of the U.S. Uh, presidential campaign and, and election cycle, good times, except for the economy. Uh, by the summer of 2008, the U.S. economy had already started to slow down. U.S. GDP then contracted sharply in the fall of 2008 and the first half of 2009. As a, as a point of, of emphasis, it was uh, September of 2008 that the investment bank Lehman Brothers collapsed and, and the uh, nadir of the financial uh, crisis sort of took hold. Across the world during this time period, the United States was not alone. There was an economic contraction that was almost sim simultaneously taking place across the United States, Europe, as well as across a number of uh, previously growing major emerging markets like Brazil, Turkey, uh, South Africa, Mexico, especially during this period of the, the fourth quarter of, of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009. Their economies were contracting sharply Industries began to lay off workers and unemployment began to rise. Even the really high achieving emerging markets like China and India were not immune to the economic pressures. While they didn't go into economic contraction, they did too suffer slowdowns to their growth trajectories that they had been previously experiencing uh, in the run up to the crisis. And just as gross domestic product or GDP was falling in 2008, trade flows started to collapse as well. Nominal exports and imports collapsed across all regions of the world, somewhere between 30 to 50 percent, depending on, depending on the country that you're talking about. This was sudden, simultaneous, and almost unexpected. What was happening? Uh, why was GDP plummeting so quickly? For that matter, why were trade flows falling even faster than gross domestic product and economic contraction? What were the explanations behind what was going on? Now. With respect to the question about international trade and trade flows, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on here, both in this work today and in my broader research, uh, there's really, in terms of the crisis, three potential explanations for the underlying root causes. The first is what economists simply call a demand shock, that at any time you have a recession where 
consumers have a major impact, negative impact to their wealth, they're going to start demanding fewer goods and services, and that includes fewer imported goods and services, and so trade flows are going to be negatively affected. So that's a potential underlying cause of the trade collapse. The second is a supply shock. You have to recall that one of the underlying causes of the global economic slowdown in 2008 and 2009 was this financial crisis. Credit markets were seizing up. There was the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the bailout of AIG, the credit default swaps and, and mortgage-backed securities and this toxic morass of a financial system meltdown. Partially contributing to the difficulties facing trade flows was that exporting firms likely had difficulty accessing credit, whether to produce their goods in the first place or to finance their transactions across borders. So this is likely a contributing cause as well. The third and perhaps uh, one of the most highly played up potential causes is what we'll refer to as protectionism. So what is protectionism? Protectionism broadly is just the idea that countries are imposing new trade barriers in order to shield their domestic industries or to protect their domestic industries from having to compete with foreign produced goods, imported goods. And protectionism was a potential concern during this time period. We really weren't sure what was happening. Perhaps what was happening in addition to the demand shock of an income of incomes falling, a supply shock of, of credit markets seizing up, perhaps governments were doing surreptitious, nefarious things that were you know, imposing new trade barriers that were also adversely affecting trade flows, and this has somehow gone undetected. In any case, this was the concern at the time. And there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, it was really unclear as to what was happening, but there was a, a tremendous amount of interest in, in what was going on. It would ultimately become clear that protectionism, new trade barriers, did not cause either the trade collapse of 2008, 2009, and they did not really contribute much to the slowdown in economic activity uh, during that time period either. Nevertheless, there was a substantial concern about protectionism, and this continued to, to play uh, a major role in, in the mind of government policymakers. And so a question of substantial interest to scholars is why? And to understand that, I think it's useful to take a step back in time and, and move away from 2008, 2009, or more recent period, and look back to the Great Depression in the 1930s. The economic historian Doug Irwin at Dartmouth College has a wonderful new book just published titled Peddling Protectionism, Smoot Hawley and the Great Depression. And in this book, he tells uh, the wonderful, wonderfully exciting or interesting, not wonderful in terms of economic impact, but wonderfully interesting story of both what led to the Smoot-Hawley tariff, but then also the economic implications and consequences of the US tariff in the 1930s and the role that it played in the Great Depression. So let's, let's tell the story, or, or, or to do so quickly at least. The short version is this. The United States suffered a stock market crash in October of 1929. At this point in time, the Smoot-Hawley tariff was already being debated but it had not yet come into law or been signed into law by the president, President Hoover. That did not happen until the middle of 1930. Uh, what happened at that point in time is the United States increased tariffs um, by not trivial amounts. Tariffs were increased and, and pretty much across the board. This was the initial act of protectionism, the raising of trade barriers, the idea of trying to shield U.S. industries, domestic, domestic industries from having to compete with uh, foreign produced products. Nevertheless, the immediate negative impact of these tariffs wasn't necessarily felt and would really take uh, a period of, of throughout the 1930s for the full economic consequences of this initial act of protectionism to become realized. And this is for a couple of reasons, as, as Doug Irwin points out in his book. The first was that during this time period, the United States <coughs> applied its tariffs largely as what are called specific tariffs or specific duties or per unit taxes. And normally that's relatively innocuous, but during this time period when there was substantial deflation and falling import prices, what may have seemed initially like a small tax if it was five cents per pound or 10, 10 cents per dozen uh, became much more pernicious and had a much larger impact on destroying trade flows as prices declined and deflation took hold, which was certainly the case in the early 1930s. The second uh, main consequence or, or ultimate consequence of the Smoot-Hawley tariff was the international response. 
And so ultimately, U.S. trading partners who were adversely affected by the tariff, the U.S. tariff chose to retaliate. And they enacted their own discriminatory trade policies, which ended up hurting U.S. exports uh, and contributing to the economic malaise of the Great Depression through the latter part of the, the 1930s. In fact, the famed economist uh, Charlie Kindleberger has this wonderful image in his book, The World in Depression, uh, of the collapse of global trade flows in the 1930s, the early 1930s, right after the imposition of the Smoot-Hawley tariffs. And it looks like essentially a spider web. That, you, know, you initially started on the outside of the web, and then over time and really, really quickly, global trade flows just went into this, what they now call the Kindleberger spiral. Toward, heading toward the interior point of Europe. So to summarize, the Smoot-Hawley tariffs certainly did not cause the Great Depression of the 1930s. That was onset before the, they were even enacted. Nevertheless, the tariffs and then the retaliatory response by US trading partners created a new system of trade barriers that made it very difficult for trade flows to resume and, and countries to try to grow their way out of the, the, the very tough macroeconomic conditions of high rates of unemployment uh, and, and the lack of economic activity in the, late, in the mid to late 1930s. So that was the concern at that time. Now, with that image in mind, it's, we can return back to our discussion of, of the more recent crisis era of 2008-2009. To recap, once again, what was going on then, 2008, trade flows had collapsed. GDP was contracting sharply across all regions of the world. Industries were shutting down, they were laying off workers, firms were going bankrupt. And certainly comparisons were being drawn with the Great Depression era and what had happened during that time period in the 1930s. To illustrate the, the public concern at this time and the interest in, in the Great Depression in particular, uh, it's useful to take advantage of, of new technology and to utilize this thing that Google makes available called Google Trends. So you can, you can go onto Google's website and use Google Trends to look at various search terms and see how their frequency changes over time. So for example, you might look at searches for World Cup and you would see, ah, oh, there's spikes in interest in the terms World Cup, the, the worldwide soccer tournament in June of every four years, June of 2006, June of 2010, the last two times it was held. If you do a search on Sony PlayStation, you'll see a large spike right before the December holidays each year. So in my book, I have a chart of uh, internet searches for displaying the Google data on searches for the term Great Depression. And not surprisingly, you see in the fall of 2008, in October of 2008 in particular, a large spike in public searches for, for this term. The same thing for the word protectionism. Uh, in late 2008 and early 2009, the public is clearly concerned about these terms that perhaps they hadn't heard too much about before and, and now all of a sudden they're interested in. So what was it that was going on during this time period and why were they concerned? And that's where this book picks up. The concern is that during this time period of late 2008, 2009, we were going to essentially suffer a repeat of what had happened in the 1930s. Um, it, was, it certainly became clear relatively quickly that while new trade barriers had not caused the great trade collapse of 2008, 2009, just like new trade barriers, the smooth high tariff didn't cause the great recession of the 1930s, there was a concern that new trade barriers might impede the ability to get out of this crisis. For what happens in an economic recession is it's very much a, a, a powder keg. Uh, you have a lot of uh, displaced workers, high rates of unemployment, firms that are shut down, and the concern is that Companies and individuals will go, will go to their political representatives and say, hey, we would like for you to erect new trade barriers so that we don't have to compete with foreign produced goods. And while that may work on occasion, uh, if a country does it for a short period of time and it's the only country to do it, certainly in this era, that was not going to be the case. For as soon as one country started to do a, a major act of protectionism, surely the world would follow and there would be retaliation and then what ends up happening is everybody worse, is worse off. You end up in a world of what they call beggar thy neighbor policies, in which case everybody wishes at the end of the day that, we had, that none of us had ended up imposing these trade barriers in the first place. And this is really one of the important lessons that I think we had learned from the Great Depression era in the, in the 
1930s to try to avoid those kinds of situations and through the establishment of, of cooperative institutions. Thus what took place in late 2008 and 2009 is the World Bank and other institutions like the World Trade Organization, the WTO, and a new entity called the Global Trade Alert really stepped up efforts to monitor what governments were doing in terms of the trade policies that they were enacting, to really identify and, and show to the public when it was that governments were making changes with respect to their trade policies. Nevertheless, uh, what happened over 2008 and 2009 is, is actually somewhat surprising. Despite the Great Recession ravaging a number of economies, there was not a large-scale resort to protectionism in the imposition of new trade barriers on anywhere near or anywhere close to the scale of what we saw in the 1930s. And this is somewhat surprising. And this ultimately is a fundamental, fundamentally important question. Why was that? Uh, what was it about the, the world economy, the international trading system, that prevented this, catas this catastrophic set of events that took place in the 1930s from repeating themselves today in 2008 and 2009? So there's a, likely a number of contributing explanations to that question as well. Uh, and I won't go through them all today. This is going to be a lot. The, the answers to this question are going to form a long line of, of research that's going to take a, you know, a, a number of years to really fully develop. Ultimately, this question of what prevented the, the same protectionist catastrophe of the 1930s recurring again today, um, while being of fundamental research interest, is also not the fundamental question of interest to this book, to my book, um, The Great Recession and Import Protection. The goal of this book is actually much more modest. While it is a fundamental question that, that, that researchers are going to be addressing, the purpose of this book is to really just lay out what the facts are. And it's important to lay out what the facts are because there already are misconceptions about what did and did not happen in terms of trade policy changes taking place during the crisis. While there was not a large scale resort to protectionism, it is entirely inaccurate to say that countries did not change their trade policies during this time period. Many countries were actually quite active with respect to their trade policies. And that's what we describe in this book. We go into, into great detail to show the extent to which countries changed in, in certain instances, in certain instances did not change trade policies. And in particular, we look at policies like anti-dumping, safeguards, countervailing duties, what the book refers to as temporary trade barriers. Trade barriers that are really only supposed to be imposed for a small, a short period of time. What are some examples of some of these temporary trade barriers? Well, it, it's it's fascinating because a number of, of, of these policies were the ones that were of substantial media attention during the crisis uh, that, that the public really picked up on. The first is uh, in a European case or, or set of, of what they call anti-dumping trade barriers that were imposed on footwear from China. Another example is the uh, safeguard that the United States imposed on imports of tires from China. China itself used anti-dumping uh, to address imports of steel fasteners, some sort of uh, product used, I think, for automobiles from the European Union, and also as a retaliatory uh, action against US exports of chicken feet and, and potentially automobile. Um, so there, these were all stories that were prevalent in the media at the time and sort of feeding the, 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 the fire of the concern about the rise of increased protectionism and so arguably, they, they, they played a, an important role of what was happening during the crisis. To throw out a few facts that we, that we illustrate in the book, there was overall an increase in the use of these kinds of trade barriers during the crisis. Overall, the G20 economies, the group of 20 economies, increased the, uh, the number of products that they imposed these sorts of trade barriers over by 25% by the end of 2009 compared to the end of 2007 or the period right before the crisis started. So 25% increase. It's a large increase, but even that being said, it goes from somewhere in the low 2% range of all products being covered to you know, 2.5%, say. So it's still not affecting a large, an incredibly large or onerous value of trade. Furthermore, there's substantial variation across countries as to who is doing what. 
most of the new activity in terms of new trade policies being imposed were being imposed by the high growth emerging markets. Uh, and that is somewhat surprising. On the other hand, the really ravaged high income markets, the US, the European Union, were actually quite restrained and didn't see much growth of their use of these trade barriers at all. And so again, on its face, this is somewhat puzzling because the historical evidence from, from economic research shows that during times of, of recession, like what we saw during this time period, this is usually when you see these kinds of trade barriers being imposed. Why didn't that happen this time around? What was it about the international economy, the cooperative international system that prevented this from taking place despite the dire economic circumstances? So the team of academic scholars that joined me in contributing to this volume did a magnificent job of really laying out a very detailed set of empirical facts about what countries were doing in terms of changing their trade policy during this time period, uh, the products, the industries that were being affected, the trading partners that were being affected. And they also take care to put this into historical context, to not look at this as a, as a one-off, but to see how this fits into the broader narrative of how these countries had been adjusting their trade policy over time. Many of these countries, especially the emerging markets, had undergone substantial periods of trade liberalization in the 10 to 15, 20 years before the crisis. So they were, at some level, able to really withstand uh, the crisis you know, and, and keep their economies open, where that might not have been the case in earlier eras. The, the other contributors to this volume really go into detail on a country-by-country -country basis to, to look into these questions, establish facts, and explain the patterns that they're seeing in the data. Um, why did we choose this approach? Why focus on temporary trade barriers? Well, that's a very good question. I think and we don't answer it conclusively in this work, but there is a theory or a hypothesis that ultimately will and need, needs to be and will be tested out there by, by scholars in the future that is something like this. It's the existence, perhaps, of the access to these kinds of trade barriers, anti-dumping, safeguards, countervailing duties, which helped countries withstand the protectionist forces that might have otherwise arisen and, and taken over and played a much larger role during this particular recession. 